if you would uh, bow your heads and join me in prayer, and we'll get started. Father, I thank you for bringing us back here in this new year. As the world around us uh, attempts to carry out their resolutions, I pray that it would be our resolve to know you more, and not just this year, but into eternity. And I pray that tonight would be a time where we would do just that, and that your spirit would be with us, and you would teach us what you would have us to learn. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let the Israelites go. In case you are unaware, in your Bibles, when you see those four capital letters, L-O-R-D, Lord, in your translations, it is your translation's way of telling you that the Hebrew text has the name Yahweh, the name of God, there. It's something that only occurs in the Old Testament. So, continuing, God also said to Moses, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but my, by my name Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Now, immediately at this point, people who don't believe the Bible object, and they will say that the name of Yahweh appears constantly on the lips of those three individuals just mentioned in the book of Genesis. And they are absolutely correct in noting that. However, as with most supposed contradictions in the Bible, they are usually resolved if you just keep reading. And so continuing in Exodus 6, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you, and I will redeem you with mighty acts of judgment, and I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And here's the part to take note of. Then you will know that I am Yahweh, your God. I'm calling this lecture the Day of the Lord. I have two divisions. The first division is titled Deliverance in the Day of the Lord, and it covers the first two chapters of the book of Joel. So, if you would, open your Bibles with me to the book of Joel, beginning in chapter 1. And we're really just going to flow through the text. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. Tell them what? Of the great devastation that the locust swarms have brought upon the land. It's time to wake up the drunks because there's no more wine for them to drink because a nation of locusts has invaded my land. A mighty army of them, and it has stripped bare the land of all vegetation. There is no more food. The trees are stripped bare. The farmers mourn because there's nothing left to harvest. The priests mourn because there are no more offerings. How are they going to survive? The locusts have destroyed everything. There's no more food to eat. The whole nation is going to starve. Joel begins to give instructions to them now in verse 13 of chapter 1. Put on sackcloth, priests, and mourn. Spend the night in sackcloth because the sacrifices are withheld from the house of your God. Mourn because you have nothing to sacrifice to God to atone for the sin of your land. Which makes the next string of commands beginning in verse 14 seem very strange. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon everyone to the house of the Lord to cry out to him. But not for this famine. No. Wail for that day. Because the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Yes, wail for that day. Because it will be like this one but so much worse. This is a common presentation of the day of the Lord in Scripture. A day so terrible that it can only be described as the worst thing you could possibly imagine, only to tell you, in that day, it will be even worse. 
And so Joel says, beginning in chapter 2, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill in Jerusalem. Wait, you might say, this is Jerusalem. These are God's people. Why are we sounding the trumpet of alarm for them? Note that this is not a call to the nations, the equivalent of unbelievers in our day and age. No. This call for alarm goes out to those who claim to be the people of God. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. And as dawn spreading across the mountains, so a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. Now, the notes will pose the question of whether or not this army is the locusts or whether it is an actual physical army. And the notes, like myself, conclude that it is a blend of both. Joel uses the picture of the locusts to talk about this great army that will come. Not the nation, not the army of Assyria, and not the army of Babylon. No, a greater army that is much worse. Verse 20 calls it the northern horde. This is the army described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, speaking of Gog of the land of Magog, and in more familiar terms to us in Revelation 16. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the day, great day of God Almighty. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. This is that army. Joel continues to describe this army in terms of the locust plague that was afflicting his people in chapter 2, verse 3. Before them, a fire devours. Behind them, a fire blazes. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. With a noise like that of chariots, they leap over the mountains, like a cackling fire consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. They charge like warriors, verse 7. They scale walls like soldiers. They all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They cannot be deterred. They plunge through defenses without breaking ranks. They rush along the city. They breach it. They run along the wall. They climb into houses like thieves. They enter the windows. As Jeremiah describes, death climbs through our windows and enters our fortresses. Before them, the earth shakes and the heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine as the general of this great army comes into view. Who is the one coming against the city of God, Jerusalem? Perhaps it is the Antichrist. Perhaps it is Satan. But no. Verse 11, Yahweh thunders at the head of his army. And the people who perhaps had thought that deliverance would come from Yahweh now find that he is the one that has come against them. Ezekiel 38, 16 gives the backdrop. You will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. In the days to come, Gog, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the one I spoke of in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel. At that time, they prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. Now back to Joel. His forces are beyond number, and mighty are the, is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it when Yahweh comes against you? In Acts 2, Peter gave his great speech at Pentecost, and he told the people that the long-awaited Messiah, the one that God had finally had appointed that would rule their people, had come and that they had murdered him. And in response to that, the people, realizing that God was now their enemy, cried out, Brothers, what shall we do? And we might expect Joel to be the one to tell us, but it is actually Yahweh himself in verse 12 of Joel, of Joel chapter 2. 
the leader of the great army that has come against them. Even now, declares Yahweh, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to Yahweh your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And then we find the same words that were on the lips of the king of Nineveh back in Jonah chapter 3. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? Perhaps he may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. It's quite interesting that it's a quote from the pagan king of Jonah 3. After all, this is Jerusalem people of God, but it's quite clear that they have become God's enemy. What difference is there really between them and the wicked Assyrians, the wicked Ninevites? And for that matter, what difference is there really between us and them? Brothers, this is a common call in the prophets and in the whole Bible. Remember, this is not a call to the unbeliever here. This is, we'll get to them in chapter three. This is a call to us, to those who claim to be the people of God. And it is these very people who have found themselves to be God's enemies. Brothers, what shall we do? Joel begins to give the commands in verse 15 in staccato fashion. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders. Gather the children. Even those nursing at the breast. What are they going to do? Doesn't matter. Bring them. At the end of verse 17, there's a room and a chamber mentioned. Those are actually two different terms for the same thing. It is the room where the bride and groom would go to consummate the marriage. Joel says, no, there's no time for that. Get them out of there. Let's go. All hands on deck. And let the priests say, weep, priest, priests weep and say, spare your people, Yahweh. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And Yahweh responds to this true repentance. This is the day spoken of in Zechariah 12.10, where it says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. And then note this language, and they will look upon me, upon him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn bitterly for him as one mourns for an only son, and grieve bitterly over him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Just as the people in Acts 2 were cut to the heart when Peter told them that they had done that very thing, and they asked him, what shall we do? And then Joel says the very thing that Peter quotes in Acts 2, speaking of the same spirit that Zechariah spoke of being poured out. And he says, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people, just as was seen in Pentecost. Just as the day of the Lord will be like all of those horrible judgments, but worse, so this great deliverance will be like that one, but greater. Verse 32, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. Saved there is literally the word escaped, escape. In verse 2, it said that nothing escapes this army of Yahweh. No, the only way of deliverance is surrender. In the terms of Isaiah and Micah, we must beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks, and surrender, laying down our arms and surrender to the king, to the one we have pierced. Who is that exactly? Because if you recall the Zechariah passage, they will look upon me, upon him whom they pierced. You will know that the first clause, they were looking upon God, but in the second clause, they're looking upon him whom they pierced. Why is there a distinction, almost as if he's talking about two different individuals? We turn to John 8, 
And in verse 28 of John 8, Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. That's the literal Greek there. Many translations will add he afterward, but that's not correct. It's the name of God from Exodus 3, but in its Greek form, ego, a me. The same thing that appears at the end of the chapter, that same chapter when he says, before Abraham was, I am. But in verse 28, he uses the same statement that God used in Exodus chapter 6. When the Son of Man rises from the dead, then you will know that I am Yahweh. This is how God reveals himself. In his great acts of deliverance and in his great acts of judgment. And Peter said to them in Acts 2, This same Jesus who you crucified, God has made both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. In the words of Joel, rend your heart and not your garments. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Just as Joel had said, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. That is the call to us today. If we would claim to be God's people, we must not only be baptized, but we must also repent and turn from our sins. The application is yours. My principle is this. God makes himself known through the salvation of his people. God makes himself known through the salvation of his people. My second division is titled Destruction in the Day of the Lord, and it covers chapter 3 of Joel and the book of Obadiah, which is actually where I'm going to start. Joel 3 now turns to these nations that have gathered against Jerusalem in this great army, and Obadiah speaks of Edom, which is one of those nations, but it is a unique nation. The Edomites were descendants of Jacob, or descendants of Esau, rather, sorry, Jacob's brother. In the tent of Rebekah, a war began in Genesis 25 when God said to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb and two peoples within you will be separated. One will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. That younger brother was Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Esau hated his brother Jacob because he stole the blessing of the firstborn from him. And throughout the generations, that hatred never really died. And he says to Edom in verse 2 of Obadiah, See, I will make you small. That same word that was used to describe Jacob being younger, back in Genesis 25. Then in verse 3, As the serpent deceived the woman in the garden, so the pride of your heart has deceived you. And you think you are so great because of the kingdom you have built in the clefts of the rock but I will bring you down from there. What is the reason for God's displeasure of the nation of Edom? Jump down to verse 10 and you will see. It is because of the violence against your brother Jacob. Even a thousand years later, the nation of Edom still hated the Israelites, their brothers. But God still sees two boys in the tent of Rebekah fighting for dominance. Now, a bit of background. Edom was not a particularly powerful nation. It, they really relied upon alliances with other nations who would do their dirty work for them. And so in verse 7, that's going to be turned against them. Your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive you and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. In other words, because of your treatment of your brother Jacob, those people that you considered allies or brothers will treat you in the same way. 
Because, verse 11, on the day when an enemy came against Jerusalem, you stood aloof. Now, we don't know exactly when this is referring to, but there are several suggestions. The two most prominent being the raid by Philistia in 2 Chronicles 21, or the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Babylon in 586 BC. Now, in both of those events, Edom did this. But I take it as referring to the Second Chronicles 21 incident. So, in that day you stood by and watched, but you did more than watch. You joined in. You were like one of them. It was like a stranger came in and started beating up your little brother, and rather than stop it, you joined in on the fun. And then the prophet lays out a series of statements, and grammatically, they are in the form of commandments. You shall not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You shall not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize the wealth in the day of their disaster. You shall not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. These are given in the form of commandments. You shall not do these things to your brother. But unfortunately, they did. And in Jeremiah 49, there is a passage condemning Edom that is largely parallel to the whole book of Obadiah that is written after 586 BC in the destruction of Babylon that is missing these commandments. They did not repent from their behavior when Babylon came knocking. No, they did it again. Psalm 137 verse 7 shows it to us. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. And so Jeremiah, weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem in Lamentations 4.21, says, Rejoice and be glad, daughter Edom, you who live in the land of Uz. But to you also, the cup of judgment will be passed. You will be drunk and stripped naked. Your punishment will end, daughter Zion. He will not prolong your exile. But he will punish your sin, daughter Edom, and expose your wickedness. And so verse 15 says, The day of the Lord is near for all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. And in another judgment of Edom, Ezekiel 35 says, I will fill your mountains, the very ones they trusted in, referenced in the opening verses of Obadiah, with the slain. Those killed by the sword will fall on your hills and in your valleys. I will make you desolate forever, and your towns will not be inhabited. And then the refrain again. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. Now you can turn back to Joel chapter 3. Speaking of the day of the Lord again, but now turning from the great deliverance, he says, In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, there is no such geographical location with that name. It does not exist at the present. There is a possibility that it will exist, or it could refer to a different valley that does exist, but the focus is not so much on where it is as to what it is. It is the valley where Yahweh judges, because Jehoshaphat means Yahweh judges. And there, these nations, and remember, we are dealing with that great army that has been assembled against Jerusalem, will be put on trial for what they did to Israel. Edom in Obadiah was just a sample of these nations. They will all be judged for what they have done against God's people. If you were there for our study of Matthew last year, you'll recall the judgment of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, where the nations were judged on the basis of how they treated God's people. It's the same idea here. 
And these were the nations that Yahweh assembled against Jerusalem in the last chapter of Joel. But now, Yahweh has switched sides. His people have repented, and he is no longer against them. Now he will defend this Zion against this great army. And so, speaking of that day, this day of this great army in Ezekiel 39, the same passage referencing Gog that we read in the first division, I will restore, he says, I will restore the fortunes of Jacob, and I will have compassion upon all the people of Israel, and I will be zealous for my holy name, and they will forget all their shame and unfaithfulness they showed toward me. When I have brought them back from the nations and gathered them from the countries of their enemies, I will be proved holy from them, through them in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am Yahweh, their God. For though I sent them into exile among the nations, I will gather them into their own land, not leaving any behind. Just as Amos had said, I will no longer hide my face from them, for I will put my spirit on the people of Israel. The same thing that Joel had just said a couple verses earlier, declares Yahweh. And so just as Joel had given staccato orders to repent to Jerusalem in chapter 2, he now gives staccato orders to the nations that have assembled to make war against God, beginning in chapter 3, verse 9. If they will not surrender to Yahweh, the sovereign God, as Jerusalem now has, they must prepare to fight against the Almighty. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. In Isaiah and Micah, we referenced in Isaiah and Micah, which we referenced earlier, the people of God were to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They didn't need those weapons anymore. But by contrast, these nations will need all the help that they can get. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. We don't have enough weapons. Make something out of those farming implements. And just like chapter 2, it's all hands on deck, but this time to go to war against Yahweh. Let the weak say, I am strong. That's where that verse comes from. Context is important. Let the nations be roused into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And we see the play on words here. For there, Yahweh will sit to judge, or will sit to Shaphat, the nations on every side. Verse 13, swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the wine press is full, and the vats overflow, so great is their wickedness. And it is as if, is as if this valley has been prepared, as if it were, to be a giant geographic wine press, sandwiched between two mountains, where the harvesters would get in and just stomp the grapes and all the nations have been gathered into it verse 14 multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the lord is near in the valley of decision isaiah 63 sees this imagery and as if if the people from jerusalem are looking over the wall and they say who is this coming from edom from basra with his garments stained crimson who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? And Yahweh responds, It is I, proclaiming victory, mighty to save. And they ask, Why are your garments red? Like those of one treading the winepress. I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. It was for me the day of vengeance. The year for me to redeem had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk and I poured their blood upon the ground. This is the future day of the Lord for the unbelieving world. In the first two chapters, we saw the terrible nature of it for the people of God. 
But Yahweh will deliver those who truly belong to him. But there is no hope for the unbelieving world in that day. They have determined to fight against the Almighty. Joel 3.16, And Yahweh will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem, and the heavens and earth will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. And then, in the Hebrew, the same phrase that we have already seen, then you will know that I am Yahweh, your God, and that I dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In the last verse of Obadiah, we'll finish our look at these passages. And the kingdom will be Yahweh's. In Philippians 2, speaking, it says, speaking of Jesus, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Then you will confess. Then you will know that he is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. He will either be glorified in your true repentance and your salvation, or he will be glorified in his judgment against you for your evil. For as Jesus also says in John 8, if you do not believe that I am, you will indeed die in your sins. My principle is this. God makes himself known through the judgment of the wicked. God makes himself known through the judgment of the wicked. It is unfortunate that many get the wrong idea from the rendering of Joel 3.14. It is not the value of our decision. It is the value of his decision, his verdict. Do not wait until that day to repent and surrender to the one who will come against you. And this is not a message I speak only to any unbelievers who may be among us, though that is certainly true. But I speak also to us who would claim to be God's people. Brothers, what should we do? You know what you must do. As Peter says, repent and be baptized. And as Christ said, repent and believe the gospel. Do not pray some contrived prayer. And do not walk these aisles. Lay down your arms. Beat your swords into plowshares. Rend your heart, not your garments. Turn to him with your whole heart. Surrender to your king. Father, in your word, you call us to examine our lives, to see if we are in the faith. I pray that you would, through your spirit, bring us conviction and repentance from the sins of our lives. And that by your spirit, we would fix our gaze upon you. For you are the only deliverer. And I pray that we would all know you. I pray this in your name. Amen.